I'm Cisco Gooding, coming at you from the University of British Columbia, going to discuss quantum mechanics and how it applies to the mind, potentially, and a little bit about neurophysics, and a little bit about Roger Penrose. The talk I'm going to give is called Warm Quantum Coherence in Biological Systems and Orchestrated Objective Reduction. Um, so, first off the bat, we're just going to discuss some preliminary considerations. Um, all of us are familiar with our own subjective experience, but there seems to be a little bit of a conflict. We think we have this notion of free will, but we also see that the laws of physics that apply to everyday objects around us also seem to apply to our own bodies. And reconciling those two things becomes a rather difficult thing, and it's held back our understanding of the mind and our own consciousness uh, to the point where it's still a very confusing field for even people that are working in it. Um, and the question we're going to discuss in this talk is, can minds be understood entirely in terms of physical law? Um, that's a big question that a lot of people disagree about. With the rise of artificial intelligence, um, one wonders that perhaps we're biological computers ourselves, or possibly we're something else. We don't really know yet, but there are ways of thinking about it that can allow us to dissect those questions and possibly get to a further understanding of ourselves and the artificial intelligence that we're creating more and more as the years go by. Um, so just as a quick outline of what we're going to talk about, um, Gödel's theorem is a very important result in the history of logic and um, the study of formal systems and mathematics and computational theory as a whole. We're going to discuss an application of Gödel's theorem that Roger Penrose has been advocating about and how he interprets it and applies it to our brains to conclude that there is something non-computational happening in our thought processes. Um, these are, of course, full of speculations, and I will make sure to point out when Penrose is being speculative and when there are concrete points that we need to address and need to discuss and take seriously. Um, but then, of course, we also need to be accountable to reality. Um, is there any evidence to either support or refute Penrose's claims, which start with Gödel's theorem and end with lots of claims about microtubules and what's happening with quantum mechanics in the brain that may or may not have observational evidence, but we're going to explore those as we go on through. And then, just to wrap up, we're going to talk, talk about what the implications of these things are for how people, and specifically our minds, are going to interact with machines and the artificial intelligence that we create in the coming years. So as a little bit of background, we're going to discuss uh, Gödel's theorem. Um, initially, it was a way of curbing, well, it, the result was that it curbed Hilbert and a bunch of other famous mathematicians' ambition to generate all truths in mathematics as theorems of one master formal system. Um, Gödel was exploring these ideas and came up with a very surprising conclusion that for every sufficiently powerful formal system, there exists a statement expressible within that system that is true, but not derivable as a theorem of that system. Um, the linguistic analog of this idea is uh, this statement cannot be proven by your system or that's rather the linguistic interpretation of the strings that Gödel was constructing from any sufficiently powerful formal system. And when you think about that interpretation of them, they clearly have to be true, because if they were not true, then you could prove them, but then, of course, they would not be true. Um, just. Uh, the statement itself, so you'd be proving a falsehood, which is not possible in a consistent theory. So the undecidability of that thought within the system itself leads to a true statement that cannot be proven within the system. And you see that that implies that the set of all theorems derivable 
within a system is not the same as the set of all truths of that, about that system. So Gödel pointed out a distinction between theorems and truths in formal mathematics. And more importantly for us is Turing's reformulation of these ideas in terms of computations and computational theory. Uh, a very important idea along these lines of thinking is something called the halting problem. If we think of the set of all possible computations, it's an innumerable set, and one of the things about that set is that each individual computation might terminate in a finite amount of time, or it might not. Simple programs that terminate in a finite amount of time are, for instance, starting from one, check the natural numbers to see if the number plus one equals three. Well, that is going to terminate very quickly at two. But if we want to find a natural number that if we add it to three, we get one, starting from one, counting upwards, that is never going to terminate because we will never find such a number. So some of these computations terminate in a finite amount of time, and some of them do not. And Turing wondered, well, given an arbitrary computation from this set, is there an algorithm I can construct that picks out whether or not they terminate? And, and a result of applying Gödel's ideas to computational theory is that there is no such algorithm that will do that for the general case. So we say that there's a non-computational, or there are no computational solutions to the halting problem. Um, and that's going to be important for what comes soon. Now that we've established a little bit of a background, we're going to discuss directly the Penrose interpretation of Gödel's theorem. And it's uh, very similar to a argument that Lucas, the philosopher, um, came up with a while back, but it's a little bit more rigorous. And um, so together, they're kind of known as the Penrose-Lucas argument now. So if we let script DC be this uh, complete set of computations, and um, we'll restrict the class so that they're computations that take a single natural number input, and they may or may not produce an output at a, uh, in a finite amount of time. But they take in a natural number as input and the output, uh, for instance, a natural number. So if C0 and C1 and so on are these computations, then for the qth computation, C sub Q applied to N is one of the computations that may or may not finish in a finite amount of time. So fine. Now we will let A be any sound set of algorithmic um, procedures that attempts to find whether uh, these computations in this scripty C set terminate in a finite amount of time. And they're defined such that if A Q N stops, then C sub Q of N does not stop. So they indicate the non-stopping of an algorithm by themselves stopping as an algorithm. And we apply the nth computation in script C set to the natural number n itself. If a n n stops, then c sub n n does not stop. So a is then the algorithmic set that's trying to determine whether c n n stops or not. And it's defined such that if a n n stops, then c n n does not stop. Um, but then a n n is just a computation that acts on one natural number, because there's only one argument when you identify the two separate arguments in it. Um, it becomes only a function of one natural number. And therefore, it must be in the script C set, and it must be equal to C sub, Q, or C sub K of n for some other k. And if we take C K of n, and we apply it to k itself, so this sum k that exists that our ANN algorithm must be, because it has to be in the set script C. If we take that and then apply it to k itself, we get the following statement. If a, or we 
get the following equality first. A K K is equal to C sub K of K, because we've just uh, applied C K of N to the kth um, natural number, and uh, A K K is C K of N for some K. Or, pardon me, A N N is C K of N for some K. And then we'll apply that to K. From the definition of A, we find that if AKK stops, then CKK does not stop. But because AKK is equal to CKK, we see that that means that if CKK stops, then CKK does not stop. Well, clearly CKK does not stop then, because if it doesn't stop, then it doesn't stop. And if it does stop, then it also doesn't stop. So we have concluded that CK of K does not stop. Um, however, AK of K does not stop also because it's equal to CK of K. Therefore, the entire set of all possible computational means of determining whether CK of K stops does not stop to indicate the non-stopping of CK of K, and therefore there is no algorithmic means of determining that CK of K uh, does not stop. But we just did. It in fact does not stop. So Penrose concludes from this that human mathematicians are not using nobly sound algorithms in order to ascertain mathematical truth. Um, that's the conclusion that Penrose reads from this situation. And uh, Hofstadter has a, a funny little line about it from Godelasher Bach, and he says that probably we are all inconsistent. The world is just too complicated for a person to be able to afford the luxury of reconciling all of one's beliefs with one another. Um, so, whether or not you buy that interpretation of the, the Gödel argument applied to these computations, um, it's certainly at least difficult to immediately refute. Um, not a lot of the world agrees that Penrose has the correct interpretation of it, but they all disagree for seemingly different reasons, and there's not really a consensus on it. So it's still a very controversial point, but there's not really a well-established way to refute it. So taking it seriously seems like um, something to do to just check for a possibility that a lot of people dismiss that may actually end up being worthwhile to explore. Um, so if we can determine the stopping value, or that an algorithm does not stop, and an entire set of all computations cannot determine that, then that seems to imply that we're doing something non-computational in our thinking. And that seems to cause a problem immediately with how we reconcile our knowledge of our minds with our knowledge of the physical world, because all of the physical laws that we've seen so far are computational in origin. Um, classical theory, uh, from Newtonian mechanics to general relativity, has computational structure. All of the laws are um, computable uh, for the predictions that you can make. And the same thing is actually true about quantum mechanics. So when you're immediately thinking, well, okay, well, there has to be something quantum mechanical going on in our brains, that's not even enough to uh, get us to a, a point where we can reconcile what Penrose is telling us about our brains with uh, these results. So we have to look a little bit further than that. And what Penrose does is he thinks about the combination of general relativity and quantum mechanics. Um, he points out that the problem of topological equivalence of four-dimensional space-time geometries is not computationally solvable. And in quantum gravity, we need to form superpositions of different geometries, and in order to superpose different geometries, we at least need to know if they're topologically equivalent. You can't superpose different things if you don't even know if they're the same or not. Um, so we need to be able to classify before we can superpose. And so if that problem is not computationally solvable, then there's a an apparent non-computational structure that immediately enters into quantum gravity 
that uh, does not exist in regular quantum theory or general relativity uh, individually. And so Penrose concludes that, of course, quantum gravity must be playing a role in our brains, um, which is a rather far-fetched speculation on its face, but possibly seems like it might be on the right track in light of recent evidence that we're going to discuss for the remainder of the, of the discussion. Um, and to transition us into that, we need to talk about an idea called gravitational decoherence. This is something that Feynman suggested in the 50s um, when he was developing path integral formulations of different scientific theories. And um, they include a sum over all possible uh, histories or uh, paths in the configuration space of your physical system. And what he realizes is that if we sum over all possible matter states, like of our quantum fields, for instance, or electromagnetic states and so on, if we sum over all of those, and then we really take general relativity seriously, we see, it seems like we need to also sum over all the possible metric states. And the metric is something that um, determines the curvature of a spacetime. So if we really take general relativity and this path integral idea seriously, it seems like we need to include sums over different geometries into our description of uh, a path integral formulation of, of physics. And if we do that, then it seems like fluctuations in that metric will destroy the ideas that we had about coherence that we used for quantum systems to measure how phase relationships can be maintained and how our quantum waves can interact with each other on a small scale. What happens is that we define something called a coherence length and a coherent time, or coherence time, rather. Um, these are the amount of respective uh, length or distance and time that our waves are going to maintain their phase relationships with one another. And this is the time that we can observe interference between quantum waves. Um, but coherence time and coherence length refer to some notion of geometry that exists independently of the states that we're superposing. If we also superpose gravitational states and states of our geometry, then the notion of time and length becomes ambiguous. Which time are we talking about? This, the time that, it, that corresponds to one of the states being superposed or the other? It's not clear. And when those states that are being superposed correspond to sufficiently different time and space structures, Penrose suggests that that produces an instability that leads the system to decay into one or the other of those geometries. And this is what gravitational decoherence is. Um, so, just as a little bit of extra nuts and bolts information about uh, these superpositions and so on, um, we're going to talk about the distinction between the kinematic superposition principle. In quantum mechanics, if two states are allowed, then so is any arbitrary linear combination of them, um, modulo normalization, of course. Um, that's called the kinematic superposition principle. But there's also something called the dynamic superposition principle. That says that if I have a superposed state, for instance, this one with uh, alpha and beta coefficients of two states, psi and chi, then the time evolution of those, that superposition occurs independently. That superposition is preserved over time. Um, that already seems to be in conflict with the ideas that Penrose is discussing, because if a Hamiltonian operator in this, this is known as the Schrodinger equation that describes time evolution in quantum mechanics. And we have some operator that acts on these quantum states. And on the other side of the equation, we have a time, time derivative of these things. So 
the, equi the equivalence between these defines time evolution of quantum states, and we see that there's only one time operator that acts on each individual state. If, if one of the states corresponds to one space-time geometry and one of the other states corresponds to a different time geometry or space-time geometry, then it's unclear what the time evolution operator or what the, um, in this case, the time derivative operator corresponds to. What notion of time is it, is, does it mean? If psi and chi correspond to sufficiently different space-time geometries, then it seems like we should have different time evolution operators or different time derivative operators that operate on each individual one. And so Penrose thinks that this means that there's a conflict with the superposition principle. Um, in light of the timeless structure of quantum gravity, it's not clear that Penrose is right about that. This is just an effective description when a notion of uh, an effective time exists, but those are considerations that we're not going to get into um, because they'll distract from the focus of this talk. But nonetheless, we're going to take Penrose's ideas seriously and we're going to um, discuss what he thinks happens when you have a superposition of states that correspond to different geometries. He thinks that they decay in a time that's inversely related to the energy difference or the gravitational self-energy between those two states that are being superposed. Um, and that uh, statement in its um, numerical or quantitative form is known as the Dioshi Penrose criterion. And we're going to see that that plays a relevant, or that's relevant when we try to apply these ideas to actual structures in the brain to see if the numbers work and if there's actually any possibility of Penrose's ideas being applicable to human thought. And um, that leads us to a discussion of objective reduction. We, we've talked about the possibilities for what could happen and a, a possible mechanism, this gravitational decoherence mechanism, to uh, produce the non-computational things that Penrose is uh, asserting exist in our brains, but we don't really know how they could apply to the brain. Um, how do our brains exploit this objective reduction to orchestrate non-computational processing? This is uh, definitely a very large piece of the puzzle that um, needs to be addressed before we can take any of these ideas really seriously as being applicable to the real world. Um, Penrose points out that there are these structures in our brains called microtubules that are a likely arena for this kind of orchestration. Um, microtubules are a main component of a neuron cytoskeleton. Um, they're protein polymers and um, they govern various things, neuronal and synaptic function. Um, they connect small scale uh, events and large-scale events with how we process information. Um, and there's a structure around them of ordered water that may shield against environmental decoherence, which is the main reason that neuroscience uh, workers and researchers do not take this idea seriously because a lot of them have this idea that our brains are too warm and noisy uh, for quantum mechanics to be relevant to them. There's so much going on and in this environmental um, radiation and interaction that decoheres the system um, just through the, environment, uh, the environmental interactions before there could be any sort of gravitational um, or really any sort of quantum processing whatsoever going on. Um, the coherence just gets destroyed by the environment. And um, that was enough for no one to take this idea seriously for a very long time. Um, and then there started to be hints at experimental evidence that contradicted that idea. Um, there started to be examples in nature, which we'll discuss briefly, of biological systems exploiting quantum coherence in 
warm and noisy environments. And um, just because we think it can happen or cannot happen, uh, if we observe it to happen, we have to reconsider exactly what our arguments are and why we came to the conclusions that we had before that seemed to be contradicted by nature. Um, so I am absolutely not a neuroscientist, I'm a theoretical physicist, but I'm going to give a brief discussion of neuroscience in the th things that will relate to our discussion here, and it's absolutely not going to be exhaustive or uh, masterful in any way, but it's going to be enough for our purposes, so try not to give me too hard of a time about that on the internet. Um, and so first, uh, just a little bit about neurons. Uh, they have a body called a soma, and that contains the nucleus and other organelles. Um, on one side of the new, uh, neuron are the dendrites, and these branch out and receive inputs from the synapses of other neurons. And the other side of the neuron contains um, the axon, which has, which has uh, various synapses, like uh, sprouting out, and they serve to communicate the outputs of information processing to other dendrites. So, um, in the past we've seen these as just input-output devices, and um, largely treated them as a black box, even though, of course, lots of uh, neurophysicists and so on are studying the intricacies of how exactly the processing happens, but largely they're considered these classical objects that, depending on the integrated set of stimulus that are um, entering the, um, the dendrites, they will either fire or not fire, and the description of that is given in terms of an action potential. Um, the details of this are not terribly um, important for our purposes, but the fact that we're integrating all of these signals and then just giving some output that determines the firing or non-firing of a neuron is extremely important, and what's happening in between is really going to be relevant to Penrose's ideas about microtubules and non-computational processing in the brain. So, excited uh, neurons send signals to neurons that they're connected to. Uh, this signal adds to the other signals received by each neuron, and if a threshold is met, um, uh, a given neuron will fire an action potential, which is an electric pulse sent through the action, eventually causing the release of neurotransmitters at the synapses. And uh, all of these different um, firings get recorded by their neighboring neurons and so on, and add it up, and if those ones are over a threshold, then um, more firings occur and so on. And this is the, the standard picture. Um, and how Penrose interprets this is that um, the, the quantum vibrations in microtubules involve uh, high frequencies, uh, around megahertz, but they can also have a fair, fairly wide range. Um, and those frequencies aren't really tremendously relevant, but superpositions of those high frequencies give rise to beating, which occur at the difference between those superposed frequencies. And those are the frequencies that are very similar to EEG signals. And those are the ones that are measured. Those are more uh, large-scale signals that for instance, you can measure by strapping electrodes to your brain, um, and lots of neuroscience experiments exist that only take into account EEG signals, and lots of, for instance, the advances in brain-controlled gadgets of various sorts, brain-controlled games, and so on, really only interact with the EEG signals, and those are sufficient to do some sorts of high-level um, processing and so on. But they're not necessarily the whole story. Um, the vibrations in the microtubules that are happening at high frequencies um, really might be giving rise to these um, orchestrations that allow non-computational uh, processing to occur at a lower level, and then the beating between them can project out 
lower frequency EEG signals that then give rise to your decision making to like shoot something in a brain brain powered uh, video game of a first person shooter or something like that. Um, whatever the task is, switch your song on your iPad or your iPod or uh, whatever the task uh, of, of the device is. Um, and Penrose even goes so far as to say that uh, orchestrated objective reduction describes conscious moments to be discrete events occurring, on average, at the beat frequency of the microtubule oscillations. And at that point, or orchestrated redu or objective reduction causes this orchestrated computation to terminate. Um, but of course, computation is being used loosely because you could get non-computational results out of it. Um, and this is just a diagram of what happens when you're integrating all of these signals from uh, different neurons that are coming into um, a particular neuron that's doing some processing. And the firing that occurs, according to Penrose, occurs in this time scale that's inversely related to this gravitational self-energy difference between the two superposed high-frequency microtubule states that are involved. And so this is just a finer detailed description of the exact same neuroscience picture that, that has been given, but it has a, a quantum mechanical flavor and a non-computational flavor. And it relates to gravity. It's, a, an, a, it's an objective aspect of space-time itself and how it interacts with, or how it uh, is, is consistent with quantum mechanical structures. Okay, so. Um, just as a further comparison to the, the standard picture, the Hodgkin-Huxley model is, uh, is what this integrated and fire uh, process is referred to as in, in neuroscience communities. Um, neurons are threshold logic devices in, in this picture, and they receive and integrate synaptic inputs as uh, membrane potentials. Um, these integrations that occur uh, that we're discussing. Um, but it doesn't occur, or I mean, it, this model doesn't describe how exactly we're choosing to integrate various aspects. It kind of just lumps them all together and adds them up, and if it's over a threshold, then it fires. But Penrose thinks that there's more orchestration happening at those finer scales, and that's what the, the previous uh, comments were referring to. So in an orchestrated objective reduction, microtubule quantum processing occurs during dendritic somatic integration, this interaction between the neurons, and the selected re results regulate axonal firings. So that's how we put our little bits of quantum gravitational processing into the outputs of these neuron firings and allow what's happening at that scale to project itself outward and um, have an impact on decision making and so on. Um, and I didn't, I kind of glossed over it in the initial slide because I wanted to wait till now. This uh, three worlds picture that Penrose likes to talk about, where we have uh, our subjective mental world that each of us views the universe through, and we have this physical world that we observe, and we have this mathematical world, the platonic realm, if you will, that exists independently of our physical universe. And these all kind of play off each other in this uh, holy trinity of sorts. Penrose likes to think that through this orchestrated objective reduction, the platonic realm implants itself into our processing, um, for instance, to come up with non-computational results to problems, and has an impact on the physical world through that mechanism, and then that leads us to have this subjective experience. And um, another way of looking at it is that the platonic realm projects itself into our subjective experience um, and so on. These really all come off and play off each other uh, in all sorts of ways that are interwoven. Um, this is just kind of a fun thing to think about. It's not really 
uh, hard science or anything like that, but um, it's just a way of kind of framing our different observations about the world and the distinctions between different aspects of things that all play a role in our entire existence. Um, so, of course, I've been taking these ideas rather seriously, unlike a lot of people in the world uh, who raise sometimes valid and sometimes ridiculous objections against Penrose's work. Um, one of the first ones uh, that was taken or as uh, seen as very significant in the community was by Tegmark in, in around 2000. And he said um, that brains are too warm, wet, and noisy uh, to exhibit any kind of quantum coherence, and therefore coherence and all these ideas are not relevant to neuroscience and to our brains. Um, to demonstrate that, he worked out the implications of a model that he constructed himself that was not used by Penrose or um, Hameroff, which is the um, anesthesiologist that Penrose worked with to develop some of these ideas. Um, in my mind, it's an absolutely irrelevant calculation that showed the decurrence time scale for microwave entanglement in the way that he modeled it was around a femtosecond scale and that that was far too short-lived for any kind of neural processing. Um, or despite that, um, despite the fact that Penrose and Hameroff didn't use this model that um, Tegmark made this demonstration with, um, the community took that very seriously and Tegmark's paper was highly influential. A lot of people who don't know a lot of the um, other things about this, like the recent observations that I'm going to mention just in a few minutes, a lot of people still consider that the nail in the coffin of Penrose's arguments, and that's really a pity because there's more to this story, and Tegmark's paper was not conclusive, and observations from nature have thrown this work into a new light, and it should be reconsidered by more people, really. And um, that's one of the things that I'm here to discuss this for. Um, so, contrary to Tegmark's claims, it was later discovered that warm quantum coherence occurs in a variety of natural places. Um, photosynthesis uh, exploits coherent electron transport, and that happens at room temperatures. Um, bird brain nav navigation involves warm, warm quantum effects, um, as well as ion channels, or sense of smell, DNA, protein folding, and biological water. Um, the references to the biological observations and the papers that they are mentioned in can be found in Penrose and Hameroff's paper from 2014 that can be looked up online. Um, so we, we see that nature is doing this. It doesn't matter if we think the brain is too warm, wet, and noisy for it to occur. It's happening, so why not try to understand it? And that's what Penrose and Hameroff's work is attempting to do. Um, of course, Penrose's Godel argument itself is widely disputed. It's not really considered correct by many people in the world, and that is not necessarily um, an argument against Penrose's later speculations. It's just something that needs to be pointed out so um, we can take everything with the right grains of salt here. Um, it would be wonderful to be able to prove that this must be the case, that we have to be doing something non-computational and so on in our brains. But whether or not Penrose's argument demonstrates that is unclear. Um, nonetheless, it's still a possibility that hasn't been disproven. And there are all these other pieces of evidence, such as coherence existing in other parts of nature, and so on, and um, the possibilities for the time scales for gravitational decoherence to match on to the processing scales within um, how integrated signals are, are combining to form um, the final resulting neuron firings in how we process information. Um, all of these little bits of information are kind of coming together in such a way that we should take these ideas seriously without necessarily believing everything that Penrose has to say. Um, so, 
we're going to mention a couple of other things. And uh, that I just found this image uh, online. Um, I'm not sure if this equation is relevant in any way to, to bird navigation and so on, but I, I thought it was a, an interesting image, so I just uh, threw it out there. Um, but we're going to talk about this observation that recently occurred of coherence in microtubules at room temperatures. Um, this Indian physicist whose name I have butchered many times, um, Anir Ban Bandyop Bandyopadhyay uh, is my attempt, um, at the National Institute of Material Sciences in Japan, um, now he's at MIT. Um, he led a team that had these experimental results about EEG rhythms driving from deeper level coherent microtubule vibrations and supporting the picture that Penrose and Hameroff have come up with about quantum processing happening at that level and on those scales. Um, Roderick Ekinoff at the University of uh, Pennsylvania um, was doing work on anesthesia, which selectively erases consciousness while sparing non-conscious brain activities, and found a link between uh, the anesthetic action and um, activity in the microtubules. So, Anesthesia is this, is this thing that, I mean, everybody is rather familiar with, but when you think about exactly what it's doing, it's cutting off your conscious awareness about the world and not really having a whole lot of impact on much else. And if we can find a connection between microtubule activity and the action of an anesthesia, then we can have extra evidence for this picture that Penrose and Hameroff are constructing and telling us about how we should view uh, fine-grained quantum processing in our brains. Um, this is a nice extra bit of information that provides evidence for this view. And um, taken as a whole, I feel like the Penrose and Hameroff perspective has a lot more substance behind it. And should be taken seriously um, for reasons a lot more than just the theoretical Gödel arguments and so on that initially they were um, relying on. So now there's experimental evidence from biology that lends credibility to these ideas. And um, that being said, uh, what are the implications of that? Why? Why should we even care that that's what's happening, other than just curiosity about our own brains and our own brain function and how they uh, give rise to our thought structures and our conscious awareness of the world? Um, well, for one thing, rather than interfacing with EEGs, um, using EEG signals to interact back and forth our minds and machines, um, since those only convey the integrated outputs of quantum processing that's happening in microtubules from this view, we should interact at the microtubule level. Then we could have the possibility of quantum computational interaction with machines and have a much more fine detailed, or I should say, we should have a, a much, much more intricate ability to convey information and communicate with uh, the upcoming artificial intelligences that might arise um, than just with the, the EEG signals because they are more of a global result of what's happening at a lower level. If we could tap in to what's happening at the microtubule level, then the possibilities for interacting with machines are just going to exponentially increase um, and give rise to fundamentally different possibilities. Um, also, current AI approaches are entirely computational, and so 
they're already limited in that they can't possibly achieve what we can if we exploit non-computational processes. One of the possibilities that this work points us to exploring is constructing physical machines that exploit the same type of things that we do in our brains to come up with non-computational processing. So we could have machines that are not computers, that are capable of doing something non-computational also, and interacting with them would be far richer than interacting with just something that's computational. So in the far future, this is looking uh, perhaps way ahead, um, that would open up a lot of doors for um, really communicating to the fullest with all of the thinking machines that we're going to be creating more and more of as the years go by. So that, that last thought is uh, going to wrap up this discussion. Um, I hope uh, people tolerated the amount of speculation <laughs> in this discussion and um, didn't find any of the details to be totally butchered by a non-specialist in neuroscience. Um, I welcome comments and uh, discussion uh, from anyone who's interested. Um, I want to give thanks to Roger Penrose for inspiration, also Bill Anra, who inspired my, uh, or who I worked with at UBC during my um, graduate degree, and gave me the project on gravitational de decoherence that led me down these pathways in the first place. I um, also want to thank Ben Tam for organizing um, all of these um, connections between me and the neurotech community. Um, I also want to thank my family and friends for supporting my unconventional ambitions through um, however they could and uh, allowing me to get by while I explore these types of things. Um, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>